All right, let's do it, though. Billy, what do you got there? Well, I got one which has five, six things on it. Um, but the first one is, is overflow pro protocol. And so this is about vichelifying your ER. Thank you. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, I, I have to acknowledge, I'm wearing my, my politics hat, so I'm going to be the president of California ASAP. And we have a bill right now, Assembly Bill 2207, which is about legitimizing overflow protocols and uh, eliminating the roadblocks that exist. So the roadblocks to going to hallway beds upstairs, there are several roadblocks. There's the fire marshal, there's nursing ratios, there are various things that prevent hospitals from doing this. And so we're trying to, in that bill, eliminate those roadblocks so others can do it more easily. Um, but the bottom line is, is that you should never let anyone ever say ED overcrowding. It's not ED overcrowding, it's hospital overcrowding. Uh, so whenever someone tries to use the word, the ED is crowded or over, crowded's okay, right? It's just overcrowding that's the problem. Um, uh, but you never let anyone say that. Always correct them and say it's ED overcrowding. There's still this myth for everyone who's outside our specialty that hospital overcrowding or ED overcrowding when they misspeak is due to legions of minor patients at the front door that could have been seen in some clinic and should have been redirected to their primary care provider. When in fact, all the data from anyone who's on the know, and all of you are in the know since you work in emergency rooms, know that it's not the front door, it's the back door. It's that I can't admit people, and there's all kinds of data about this that shows that if you're holding an admitted patient in a bed, for every admitted patient you're holding in a bed per hour, you would see, depending on what your census was and who's in your waiting room, two to three level threes per hour. And each of those represents a loss at your hospital, Rick. What's the dollar for every one of those? 428. They're not patients anymore. They're all called 428. 400. Could you bring <laughs> so another 428 in there, please? Is $428 of revenue lost that you are not seeing? Obviously, how much you lose in a given ER. There's a 428 that's left without being seen. Yeah. How much it is depends on what your payer mix is. A little company of money, I mean, Mary, um, you know, it's probably 679s. Um, at Rick's place, it's 428. So at my hospital, it's you know 24 cents. Um, <laughs> um, Canadian, 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 uh, which is good nowadays. It's better, it's good. It's, um, it's but about anyway, five dollars. That, that, <laughs> that number is important because that's how much revenue you're losing. And we just instituted the uh, an overflow, a, a full capacity protocol, a surge plan at our hospital. Prior to, and the interesting, the data is very interesting. Prior to the implementation of it, we were, and it's like the, it's like Homeland Security, right? There's black, you do a color system. Black and red means you're either dangerously overcrowded or severely overcrowded. And we were pre-implementation of the plan about 50% of the time, some in two pre-month surveys, 60% of the time, red or black. Post-implementation of the full capacity protocol, we were 1% black and our average duration on black was about two hours, and we were 20% on red. So a dramatic change in the hospital's effic efficacy and throughput without hiring any new people. Just what, by and what was the protocol? What does it do? It's a full capacity protocol that has mandated interventions where you go, you, you, once you've declared when you're red, you, your hospital is now declared an emergency. And so by law in the state of California, if you have an emergency, nursing protocols can be violated. So then we went to unstaffed beds without even going to hallways. We just started filling them. And also at, at Red, a bed is a bed is a bed. No one can say, well, these are heme beds. We're kind of, we're hoping a leukemic will come in. <laughs> no, we're putting the appy in that heme bed. A bed is a bed is a bed. There's no med beds. There's no surge beds. There's no surgical ICU and medical ICU. A bed is a bed is a bed. And so all the doors become open to, all the back doors become open. There's no hoarding of beds. And there, the first time we went to red, and theoretically we weren't admitting people in the emergency room, we were holding all these admits. The first time we went to red, and there was no embarrassment by the nursing staff, which shocked me, because I guess they don't embarrass easily. But the first time we went to red with the new protocol in place, 64 beds were found. <laughs> 64. I was like, 64 beds? That's that's like that's like 10 percent almost of our hospital capacity was being hidden from us. Yeah, it's always sabotage. You know, uh, patients being discharged. They don't call the ambulance <coughs> after lunch so that they don't have to get another bed. Beds being cleaned. Um, those kinds of things. So, no report, by the way, on red. 
Once we, we get we, to red, we, um, they, no report is called. You don't need to come. We really shouldn't. Uh, this, the there's facts. a lot of things. There's so many things to talk about here, but this yeah. thing is basically the 800-pound gorilla in this room. We can't. We, we work together. We cannot. Are you referring cannot, to me as an 800-pound gorilla? No, 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 no. no. Uh, I'm not that heavy. You're the two. I, I, I could have a big lunch, but two, 200 plus, 200 plus gorilla. <laughs> but anyway, we really can't emphasize it. This this thing is a bombshell. I mean, this has completely transformed. Uh, our workplace. I mean, my last four shifts have been so pleasant and so wonderful. We work up patients, they're sick, we resuscitate them, we make a diagnosis, and then they go. Uh, so and that has never, ever happened in the you know, time I've been at County. So it seems to me like we've, we've done this discussion many, many times and in different groups. We always have this session. And there are things that are important that we don't really have control of that are hospital-wide. And there are things that are internal to the ER that we have control of. The, this may be the 800-pound gorilla, but it, it's not something that you can just mandate. You can't just say, okay, we're going to start sending them upstairs, even whether they like it or not. So I think it's a really important thing, this exit block, the back door type stuff. But the question I always have is, how did you get people who can make the decision, the administrators, to agree to go along with this, be, to see that it's their problem, it's not just your problem. Because if it, we can rail about it all we want, but if they don't agree, it ain't going to happen. So that, was a, that was done at gunpoint. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, some of it was also done in the media, like when the And I want to ask you guys as well, I'm sure you've all dealt with this, how many of you have actually come up with a solution, and if you did, how did you get it done? Because we can yell until we're blue in the face, as long as they say it's just the ER complaining, nothing's going to happen. Any of you have, you, have you guys solved, how many of you have a problem with patients admitted sitting in your ER, and how many of you have actually been able to deal with it? So I see, yes, we have a problem, we can't deal with it. It's unanimous. It's, it, well, it, I think there's a couple of different answers if I can sort of pick up on that. One is the financial arguments, and that's generally the most compelling when you're talking to your CEO, CFO. They want the dollars. Um, there are other answers which are, you know, about surge capacity and public health. You can show them the numbers. At our place, patient satisfaction doubled uh, up from 2% to 4%. Um, That's actually, those are the actual numbers. <laughs> um, L Watts. Oh. Just imagine the 1% the below them. I can't, you know, L Watts, L Watts went down, so our L Watts went from like 8% to 5%. Hospital length of stay went down. Number of denied days, which is a chronic thorn in our administration's um, side, went down. Um, all kinds of things happen good that help you sell this. And part of it is knowing your administrators. What, is, what, is their, what are their concerns? And uh, Rick, I think, has spent a lot of time ed educating people at his place about what, what are the lost revenues. I think lost revenues. Closure to ambulance traffic is uh, $1,041. For every hour we're closed, it costs us $1,041. So you got to know the numbers like that. And you got um, the data. And the numbers have to come from the hospital. If you make the numbers up by somehow by extrapolating what you think, they won't believe it. But when it comes from them, <clears throat> and you turn those numbers around and say, listen, this is what this your behavior is costing you, um, it, uh, I think that's the only way to drive change in community hospitals. County hospitals, you're clearly doing the patient a favor. Yeah. That's why they will tolerate these intolerable waits, et cetera, et cetera. At our hospital, the patients are doing us a favor. We just never realized it. And now, now that we know what they're worth economically, it's clear that we, are, we, we can't be treating them as if we don't value them. At level red in our scale, one of the things that really makes – so the question is, well, what, what makes them less lazy now that the plan is in than before? So at level red automatically, which is one below the worst, at level red all, vol all uh, scheduled admits are canceled. Now scheduled admits are the cash cow of your hospital, right? That's where they've already done the wallet biopsy, verified the, the payment to be expected, and scheduled them to come in for you know, a day surgery or a two-day two stay for something. And so they represent substantial income. So when we get to red, the hospital administration is not happy. So they are very motivated to get off because the cash cow that was supposed to come to the hospital on Monday or Tuesday for its scheduled admit is canceled. What's above red? Black. 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 Yeah, of Black. course. What else could be above dangerously, red? It's called dangerously overcrowded. That's what it is. And when did you put this in? So it's been in play now for a little over a month at our place, and wow. we have a whole presentation about it. It's, it's adopted. For those of you, uh, if you want to go to the Cal ASAP website, you can download the entire thing and block. We've made it available. 
Um, we were told that it would be problems, that there would be patient, that there would be dangerous for patients. Sentinel events went down by half in the hospital with this. It's safer for patients, not more dangerous to go to unlicensed beds or licensed beds that aren't staffed. It's safer when you're at that level. And then invariably it boils down to whose hallways. And you have, so you have to be familiar with the, the hallway argument. Your hallways are worse than their hallways. And the reason your hallways are worse, well, if we take our emergency room, in our hallways you can get tased during a scuffle with a psych patient. TB. You can, you can come in with a broken ankle and leave with TB. TB. Um, you can come in. Their, immun- their hospital is very representative. You know? yeah. <laughs> but the point is, is that the ER hallways are higher. Terrorist attacks. Can we come in, in with T- you can, It's not so like you can also come in with TB and leave with a broken, broken ankle. <laughs> There's all kinds of variations on yeah. it. But the point is, is that our hallways are the they most. They don't even have a green zone in their hospital. <laughs> yeah. Are the highest trafficked, biggest infectious disease risk, um, noisiest, and least controlled hallways in the hospital. So if it comes down to, well, we can't use hallways, you, you, the answer is, of course you can. You're already using them in the emergency room. Well, but that they always do that. Well, no, we're using our hallways yeah. here in our emergency room. And so, then it's, so it's only a question of which hallways we're going to use. The so other you thing can is, as, as you point out, they, you know, and Peter Vicelli is always fond of saying, that once you send them upstairs to the hallway upstairs, they don't stay in it. They're never in the hallway never upstairs hallways. because there really is a bed. And there really and is they a just, bed. They, yeah. and, but yeah. the patient's there and the family's there, and they're like, yeah. Where, why are we in the hallway? <laughs> They find a bed. So the average duration of time spent in a hallway from Peter Vicelio's data in New York and uh, from data from other hospitals is if you go upstairs and you're in a hallway, your average duration of time spent in that hallway is two hours. The average duration of time spent in an emergency room hallway is uh, in the Peter Vicelio numbers, I think it's 19 hours. And that's another way by which your hallways are worse than their hallways. Their hallways, they manage to get out of them. Your hallways, they're they're practically bolted to the floor and aren't going anywhere. So it's, it's anybody do this? In yes. Orlando, I was there in Orlando last week, and we asked uh, 100 people, how many of you do this? Not one. It, no, yes, there was one hand. It was a doctor who worked at Stony Brook. Yeah. There's usually a few hands. I mean, yeah, you so anyone have a full capacity there's protocol? There's two, no one here? There's two uh, there's, in there the first, go. yeah, from Australia. Access block, you call oh, it there, right? Yeah. That's when we need a urologist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the reality was what happened is people complained about all the messages in the end, so they stopped calling it COVID yellow. Now it no longer works, so your progression is that this will appear to work. Well. Yeah, we got to watch that. The core issue is lack of beds. Right. The hospital is running at 100% capacity. You cannot have flow by definition. Mm-hmm. Now, the UK guys, we went home and I did with St Mary's in London. They have calculated. That, that's you're right, and th- and that's exactly what's happened in our system is that we're moving into a hospital that has not enough beds. But let the number of beds be the dependent variable. Let not be the waiting in our hallways be the dependent variable. Is right. what our stance is. That's what we want to. So what and, you're suggesting is that is that at some point, even if they have a few beds that they're hiding, and that of course they shouldn't be, and we should get them upstairs and they can take care of it. At some point. They're, that's going to fill up, yeah. and then there's going to be no beds anywhere, and whether we keep them down there or they go upstairs, that's not the issue. The real issue is um, why do we have hospitals that are not built to take care of the patients that they need to take Costs care of? It costs $2 million dollars a bed to build a, a, a per patient care slot. It's not States. just the bed, because remember, at UCLA, when I first got to UCLA, we were told it was a 711-bed hospital. I knew that because it was always quoted in all the papers, we're a 711-bed hospital. And that didn't count the psych hospital and the eye hospital. You know, it was 711 beds. And then at some point, we went down to 563 beds. How did that happen? The beds didn't go away. They just closed wards because nursing was, staff. They, nursing they, staffing. they, they, they didn't have nursing staff or they didn't want to have the nursing staff. And then now we're down to 400 and something bed hospitals, the same hospital. And we're moving into a new hospital, which is going to be less. So the real <laughs> issue is staffing. That's the real issue. Well, right? I, I, no, actually, I disagree a little honestly, bit. I, I, and really what true, I would honestly. say is, is that, Some yes, we need, new, we need more beds. We need more inpatient capacity, true. But there's a question about how efficiently you use those inpatient beds. And exactly. if the upstairs wards and, 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 pl- and ICUs are insulated from the chaos that is the emergency room, it's just human nature. They take their goddamn time. They're having coffee. They're on break. They're change of shift. 
But if you break the insulation barrier down and they start feeling the pressure from the emergency room, it goes up. When we did, and this has been done in country after country, Australia did it, Chile did it, other places. You, you, you bring these fancy mathematicians and flow people in. There's all these computer programs. They call it the stochastic analysis. And whenever you do this, and they did it at our place, and the result was the same as it's been everywhere around the world. When they asked, what's the best way to fix overcrowding, ER overcrowding, and they go to the administrator and say the best way to fix it is, is to make sure that hospital discharges occur by 10. They said, what? We asked you about the ER. They said, yeah, we're telling you what the answer is. And so what this shows, a lot of hospital discharges don't happen until 3, and they're blocking the bed, and you can have a discharge unit and things like that. But every time they look at it, the best way to fix the ER is to get, get people out of the hospital and be more efficient. And the second thing that Peter Vicelli always points out, which I think is important to acknowledge, which is that we schedule a traffic jam in the emergency room. And the way we schedule it is the emergency room is 365, 24-7, but the hospital wants to be 9 to 5, 5 days a week. So all the elective admissions come in and take beds on Monday. If you talk to administrators, it's amazing, they'll say, oh, Mondays must be a good day in the emergency room. It should be quiet. Anyone who works in emergency medicine knows Mondays are hell on earth. Um, because everyone who thinks they can't get to work comes in. All the admissions are coming in, and so all the beds are blocked, and so access block, or hospital overcrowding is highest early in the week, right after the busiest time of the emergency room, which is the weekend. And so we get on top of our fluctuations, which go like this, we, we superimpose another sine wave, and which is on a five-day periodicity, right. and guaranteeing a block And they do Monday. hide beds, and they could be more efficient, et cetera. But you will also notice that in the United States, over the last 20 years, the amount of the length of stay for every single disease that there is has gotten shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. At some point, you're going to get to a place where it's not about getting them out at 3 o'clock in the morning in the afternoon versus 10. All those are true. You can make, make efficiency a little bit more and a little bit more, but there's a jam. There is a jam because we have more patients than we have place to put them. And unless we solve that, we're not going to fix We're still ultimately going to get to these problems. This gentleman How do you deal with the <laughs> right. So the so Why the only so there? the only opposition to AB twenty two oh seven is the California Nursing Association, uh, which is a large lobby, and they're trying to steal our nurses in Southern California, which are SEIU seven twenty one. There's a lot of politics involved with this. Um, well, and for yeah, those you, of you that are not from California, which is everybody here. Yeah. Anyway, um, there's there's there's, <laughs> there's a, a, a law politics. that says uh, how many a regulation in the Department of Health that says for every one emergency department bed. Uh, of every four beds, you have to have one nurse, and you also have to have uh, one triage nurse in the department. So they have mandated staffing, independent of the fact that it's well, three, three in the morning or three in the evening, and they have the same thing up, up on the floors, but, you know, a little different ratios depending on where you are. This was an attempt by the nursing union to make sure that the nursing shortage would be, to, to stay the way it was or to get, get worse. worse, but it was a full, uh, full employment for the nurses, and it's really a, a unfortunate because... Um, it was passed under the guise of patient safety and all this, this other stuff, but the fact of the matter is, is it's taken our ability to staff more uh, cleverly uh, away. I mean, frankly, right. but it's not any different than what doctors do or paramedics do or anybody else do. Well, they did we here all, all of our all of our unions are based on trying to make it better for ourselves. But, we, but Jerry, what are the, about the five day and seven day thing? If you just took your hospital and you said, okay, you're a new surgeon, you're a new whatever coming on staff, you're a puppy. You're, you're, when you're a senior person, you can do your elective admissions on Monday or Tuesday. But since you're new to the staff, you're going to do your elective admissions on, on Thursday and Friday. And, you're, and the hospital is now going to be a seven-day hospital with anesthesia and ORs going on Saturday and Sunday. And we're going to run the hospital 365-24-7 uh, like the ER and eliminate the, the potential efficiency increase might be 45%. But those are staffing issues, absolutely. Uh, understood, you, but I'm just saying. If you staffed appropriately and you dealt with these are bigger issues than just what you do in the emergency room. Oh, room. absolutely. So That's why, why it's got to be a hospital the, approach. Well, I think there are these things that we should lobby for, and they are important that we get stuck with all the overflow. I think we should also talk of some, spend some of this time talking about what we can do that is independent of what the, the hospital does. Right. So internal things within the emergency department, there's a couple of things that are written here, and one that I strongly agree with and one that I actually disagree with. So I think the one thing that we have found to be uniformly helpful is bedside registration. That's something that, who, who does bedside registration here? And who does not do bedside registration? So you guys talk to each other? 
and figure out how this goes on. Talk because amongst yourselves. That's, because that's one thing that really, you know, you, know, uh, you know, this concept of getting the patient in and getting them into the bed, into the treatment area where they need to be, and then having things happen around them really uh, has been a, a winning strategy for a lot of people. So yeah, that's and one Rick thing. And Rick talks about this a lot, and I think you talked about it the, the first day at, you at, at your talk about, you know, the notion that they're here for us or we're here for them. And that, that it's crazy. Well, to you want to accordion down this time so that in the traditional ER, um, you go to the window and then you say you want to be seen, and then you go to triage, and they determine you're going to live, and then you go back to the waiting room, and then a tech will bring you in, put you in a gown, and then a, and another nurse will come in and say, what are you here for today? And then the doctor will be the fifth person to see that person. You will never get two-hour turnaround times with that because you can't get a person into a bed in, in, less, in less than 45 minutes, even if that bed is open. We want to do it in parallel, not in series. Right. And, and just the first way to do that is bring them back. Right. Of then course. stuff happens. Parallel, 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 parallel process. Okay, so we can all agree. I mean, if you haven't, if you don't do it, you really should. This is a really a no-brainer. people resist this. It doesn't cost more. It's really just much better. Registration people don't, don't want to do this. The next thing here, j just I'll, I'll throw out one more, and then we'll let which, which uh, other folks see. Which one don't you like? Which one, the one I don't like here is bedside troponin. Um, I think that bedside testing uh, has a role in, in, uh, in certain circumstances. I think a bedside glucose is important. I think we mostly agree on that. I like but the pregnancy the, test. The concern I have about, yeah, and specifically though, because this bedside troponin thing is on two of my sheets here, and the thing that we, the concern I have about that is that that probably isn't something that should be the decision-making point in those patients. I think that the bedside EKG is a, is a good uh, place to make decisions, but probably be, if you're using bedside troponin to accelerate your throughput in your emergency department, it probably isn't the correct use of the only, troponin. The only reason I I hesitate and I gave the bedside uh, testing lecture for ASAP is, is that many hospital systems are set up. We, we, I agree with you intellectually if you want to have the argument does that troponin really do it but a lot of his systems like for example here in California you want to repatriate a Kaiser patient they want the troponin and sometimes they want the second one. You want to go to your treadmill no. testing. They want the second one. And if you got to add another hour's wait it's not so much the first troponin that's killing me I'm going to have them for an hour. The second troponin is beginning to hurt a little bit when four hours into this ER course, I now need a second troponin either to transfer or go to the treadmill or whatever your non-invasive testing is. That troponin and its turnaround time hurts a little bit. So and so there are systems that, that, that make bedside troponins work very well. I, in some hospitals, I think it can affect the flow of some patients. So I would just suggest that um, while if you need, really need to do a test, it's better to have the test take a minute than to have the test take a year. We, could, we should agree on right. that. When you really, but there's a problem. There's a perverse incentive right. with testing yeah. when you make it too easy. When you make things easy, we do more of them. And that's to me, is a real problem. That's why I, have, I thought that Stuart and was that, gonna say right. something about triage testing, which is on a lot of these sheets as well. Right. Have yep. triage protocol where the nurse does it. And there are, you know, some things like a pregnancy test, that's a good idea. But some things, if you make it that, well, we're going to make everything go quicker by getting the x-ray, guess what? We'll do more x-rays than we need. My favorite example of this is the D-dimer for... Oh, dear God. ...for VTE, for venous thromboembolism. That what, how do you use a D-dimer rationally? You use it rationally in a low-risk patient. If it's negative, you don't have to do the CT that's scan. Smart. That's the blue ones. Right, so that's if you if you use it rationally, you, you, it cuts down CT scans. Never makes the diagnosis. Does nothing else in one set of patients. It will lower your chance of getting of doing a VQ scan or a CT scan. But the fact is that the two studies that have looked at, we gave one group a D-dimer and the other group not. The group that got the D-dimer did twice as many CT scans in both studies, <laughs> not because they they did it because they thought it was going to increase uh, diagnosis. It didn't. How could it make more testing? It's, its whole purpose is to make less. Well, because you started doing it in people... With no risk. With no risk. I never would have done it, but I'll feel good if it's negative. It's easy. It's quick. You might but, as yeah, well yeah, do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and it's positive. Once you do that, and then, of course, there are a lot of false positives, and now you look what you've done, Ali. But, so right. this is true of all of these strategies which say, well, let's make it easier to do tests. Because when you do that, yeah, it might help you in some patients, but I guarantee you, you're going to end up with, now, what do I do with this result of this test I didn't need in the first place? Just, yeah, and just, just to back up one step from that, it's just really part of this whole theme. We've been doing this for year after year here, and it's this whole concept that there, why the patient is there to see you, to see an experienced emergency physician. That's why, that's the key 
element here. And that's why we say bring them back, get them evaluated. Because all the strategies that are all about not seeing you and being put through these horrendous protocols and this whole concept that we'll do lots and lots of tests up front, just in general, in general, is a strategy for disaster and, and, and reckless resource stewardship. And not just the general principle here. Just it's a general trend. It applies to the troponin. It applies to the x-rays in triage. It applies to all sorts of things, the BNP and all sorts of things that, that we're trying to do. A million tests on the page, LFTs up front. When then they come and see you and you're like, you know, geez, I wish I would have had a chance to use my judgment here well, that's so that I could discharge this patient. That's get, what it's all about. It's about seeing you. You get paid the bucks to decide what they need. And, um, right. and I, I, it gets me nervous when I see these Oh, we love com com physician computer order entry keys. I can just hit the button for the belly pain. And b by touching one thing, apparently that's $4,000 worth of tests I just ordered there. You can't turn it the, off. On the belly <laughs> Everyone pain shows case. up and they're like, uh, you know, okay, I'm here to take it. And you can't turn it off. You can't deactivate it. <laughs> this, this Here's one that I really like. Uh, uh, something that I think is terrific, but that very few of us do. A holding area for patients after they've been seen by you. A waiting room an internal waiting room, not come out, out to the waiting room, but they see you, think about it. The patient comes in, you evaluate them. How many of those patients still need to be on the stretcher? You sent them off for x-ray, <coughs> you're trying to see, you know, we gave them some, some medicine, we want to see are they better. Why do they need to be <coughs> taking up that exam room? Um, when I was in England five years ago, I spent a year there, and I was, a, uh, I, was uh, uh, I saw this. They did this all the time. The patient would come in, and as soon as you were done with them, they'd go out to some other place, where, and you'd call them back later when you had their results or when you were ready to go. It, was, it made the functional space in your department <coughs> five times larger. There are some patients, they're sick. They've got to be in the bed. But a lot of patients, they don't have to be in the bed. And I really think it's a phen phenomenal idea. You de they don't give up their nurse. It's because it, they don't just get it abandoned because then people forget about them and no one will do anything. They still have the nurse. They're still responsible for them. You're still responsible for them. You have to have a system to remember when the test is, is done. But it, it, I think it's a fabulous idea. Who wrote this? Do you have to do this? That, um, that Hammonds. That was um, one of the best suggestions last week when we did the Orlando course. Made it very clear that people don't own those beds till the end of their visit, um, because that is a really, really good way to really defunctionize your department. You're, you have a woman there who's got some belly something or other. You're waiting for the uh, HCG, whatever, in terms of the quantitative kind of thing. That person can sit in a chair. Uh, we're assuming that they're hemodynamically stable. We have it. They go out to they go out to a test. They go to a CT scan. Their bed is taken. You can't put another patient in there because right. that patient's offering somewhere else. That's nice. That bed should be used. Our patients get into bed with each other sometimes. They get worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's another problem we're having. It's another problem so we're you, having. So and then they make more with, patients. You come with an ankle sprain, you go home with an STD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The other, why, uh, why are you laughing? The other, okay. There's a, gen a gentleman here. And let me tell you how pleased they are with that. <laughs> <laughs> patient satisfaction is very high. <laughs> Well, it, Some people do do that. You could do send it back to the waiting room. It, it, I think you lose a little more track of them. I think it's a little easier if you have a place where they go. And, and they know, feel like they, they've been dissed in the waiting room. And then somebody knows this is the patients who are waiting that for, for us to finish up with them. But so you have a better sense patient. of them. What? Mm -hmm. Where is that magical physical Well, you take one of the... Oh, I guess it's other space. Right? So, well, you could, take one, you could take one exam room and take a stretcher out of there and put three or four chairs in there. Or put the chairs along the hallway where the fire department doesn't like them. And They're it depends upon your place. Certain, you know, we're all in different places. Places have very big size, have different. I'm not saying you can't do it that way, but I think it's better to know who they are, where they are. They're all together, one place. These are patients I have to make a decision about and get them out of here. It, it's sort of, it's a good idea. The other thing is, we did a paper a couple of years ago where they had patients where in every room they had a gurney and they had a lounge chair, and some of the patients were board. randomized to the gurney and some to the lounge chair. And the, the lounge chair patients loved it, and the gurney <laughs> patients refused to participate. They said, I'm going on that chair. You know, this notion that you're good lying on this little cot, yeah. you know, without a pillow, yeah. is nutty. We Especially should make... Especially the uh, elderly patients who are, are, are already bent in pants. <laughs> when you put the head down, the legs go up. And, <laughs> and in that little waiting room, you know, you could have a TV, you could have a magazine that's from not from 1926. <laughs> you could actually make it a...
it's not your bed. Right. They exactly. would have to leave somewhere else a mindset change. And I, it's interesting because we have a, at our hospital we have a system where when one of our doc, when our doctors want to, they can call in a backup based on, you know, there's too many cases to be seen or something or and um, when I get called on this in backup, it's invariably I'm winding up putting people in the hall putting people in the hallway to get these rooms up because if a second doctor comes when there's one doctor and all the rooms are full of people, I you just stand there with your teeth in your mouth. You have no place to with your teeth in your mouth? That's an interesting phrase, Rick. <laughs> Rick's, Rick's, Rick's magic teeth with, out, your, with your teeth in your mouth. It's just hard to understand you. <laughs> there's, a, there's a very well-known place down uh, in, the, in the Imperial Valley where they are just overrun with patients. And the, they have a sign there that says, we will be happy to give you a, a, you know, a private place to be seen. However, it's going to take longer. If you're willing to be seen in the chair, uh, just let us know and we'll see you. They, do you want to sit at the bar, or do you want to actually want a all table? Of, all of these people, they give up a little bit of their privacy. You know, I get an ankle sprain, I twisted my thumb, but that, that, all those kinds of things. Uh, they sit in chairs. And yeah, those with a personal bad. problem are still seen in a private yeah, no, room. We, <laughs> every one of our side patients was seen in the hallway. We're like, hey, so you want to kill yourself, man? <laughs> and, you, and you want to kill him. Okay, good. <laughs> you do the same thing as I do. Yeah, I'm not suicidal today. I'm homicidal. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and then we got all these. We'll go for a drink after the shift. It's like, excuse me, how am I supposed this to see this, this this lower pelvic pain in the hall? I don't get that. This has uh, got a lot of good suggestions here this that I, I personally agree with. Like um, one of the ones my favorite is multiple techs. I'm really a believer in teching up. Um, we have way too many nurses that aren't doing nurse level work or getting paid fifty dollars an hour, forty dollars an hour. But if you have only nurses, then by default. They answer the phones, they're taking drinks to the patient, they're walking to the bathroom, they're getting them up. Cleaning of, things up. None yeah. of that. You, yeah, 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 you'd like your nurses to be giving meds and looking for response to meds. Interestingly, the nurse, again, the nursing association doesn't want this. They see Correct. this as a threat. There were no paramedics. You can, paramedic can Corman, in the rain, in, in, the, in the dark, in the rain, but they're not allowed to do a thing. But we, we're, we're the same way. We don't want people, I want, we, we I don't want, want, want but, but a lot of medics, Organized medicine doesn't want anybody else to doing something that we could be doing. I mean, the, the highest paid things are surgical things that in the Army, a medic does. You know, we, we, we're all like this. We want to protect our turf. If, we, if, we, if nobody else can do it, we're more valuable. Our nursing I, director. I'm not saying it's right, but yeah. I do. But, but let's not pretend that they're the only ones who act like Our that. nursing director said, we will have Tex and Corman over my dead body. Now, fortunately, um, we have her. them now. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> OK. <laughs> I have to. Yeah, yeah. He didn't have to yeah. do anything. He just started, as soon he as just... she finished that statement, I went, what? <laughs> Well, this is uh, yeah, another one that I like is basically uh, float nurses and the unassigned nurse who can help out where needed kind of thing. Got like a free safety? You know, I'm basically uh, saying nurses are in short supply. The Philippines are empty. We have to, we have to get the right people for the right job here, uh, and we don't have that. And many hospitals, they take great pride in we have an all RN staff ER. You're nuts if you think that that's the way to do this, especially when you're trying to we're out of money, we're not making it to the... the and it's, it's an easy sale for the nurses who work for you. Their union won't like it, but for the nurses who, you, who are working for you, you, you just tell them, I'm going to assign two techs to you. You have two scut puppies. We, res we respect your training to the extent that we want you to do the highest level nursing stuff. There's nothing about having an RN to take vital signs or chart them or empty bed pans. You know, this is, you know... We can have you go back to doing that stuff. That's what your union wants, but we can actually give you two techs, two Absolutely. scut monkeys to do all that stuff for you. It's a much smarter way to do it. For you sure. beat them until they quit. What about the bottom of the I mean, I mean, the techs that are deployed they can't numb, you know, lacerations. No, there are a lot of things they're they're not they're not allowed to do that are nuts. Although that, you know, giving ad local anesthetic, I think that that is pushing it a bit. You know, putting putting putting. Uh, Emla on the on the site. No, you don't have to have text. Give any drug. There's so many other things. There's a lot of things to do. do. Yeah, they can, EKGs. But yeah. the Phlebotomy. concept of the concept is crazy. People, you know, we have a guy who is a LVN, who who you got you will remember Jarman, who is uh, who was a medic in Vietnam. He's got phenomenal judgment. He starts IVs better than anybody I have ever met. 
and they don't let them do anything. They, you know, in, until they're really desperate and the patient's gonna die and they say, Garmin, help us out, put the IV in, he puts it in. But, I mean, it, some of this is nuts. In Vietnam, all complex lacerations were fixed by medics. And you know what, they did a great job because that's all they did. They and they loved good it. At it. Oh, yeah. it th this is not, this is, you know, what is it, what do you need to do? It's, it's, it's with your brain. It's not that we have special skills, uh, dexterity. And so a lot of this is really just turf. The way we got our corpsman back, by the way, was $2 million came with the Navy Trauma Training Program. And in order to get that into our hospital, we trained the naval physicians, was they came automatically with corpsmen. What did that say about their hospital? Was the Navy does trauma training at the and we lament the fact that we don't have as we, we we used to be like two to one, uh, two blunts for every penetrating if you picked a high injury severity score. Now we're all the way down to five or six to one. Uh, we have a lot more blunts now than we we used to have a lot of penetrating trauma, but now it's just a couple of gunshot wounds a shift. You want a, any others that you like? Yeah, there's some. This one, this this one, this one has the usually patients shooting each other because yeah. they're in the wrong bed. This one, you know? this one, this one has two that I, I agree with uh, that are I think are really smart. First off, it points out. You need to have more nursing home beds and not be afraid to use them for younger patients who are convalescent rather than for older patients who are never going to convalesce at all. I mean, what we send to the nursing home are boulders waiting for them to desiccate further and then get some CPR in their death ritual. What we need to send to convalescent homes are people who really ha who could leave a ward bed and need a day or two of antibiotics. That can be done at a convalescent home. So he points out that more aggressively using sniffs in convalescent homes is a way to offload patients from your hospital and be more efficient. And then the other one that, that they, he, he, this, this person writes is, is that when you have a lot of these older patients, uh, and you know how it is, right? When you call for the medical record, they say, uh, volume, which volume of 1 through 20 would you like? You're like, oh, God. Um, but a lot of times they have relatively simple problems, but you can't sauce them out or get them dealt with because you need social worker assistant, you need a visiting nurse. You know, so what happens? I, I mean, I don't want to say I'm lazy, but, you know, I just drop back and say, screw it, admit them. I mean, I, to, for me to sauce all that out and break it down, and this person says you can avoid those admissions if you had good social work support, good via, uh, visiting nurse support, and, w and we're willing to jump through the, the hoops. Thing. You could get them out, and they'd be happy, yeah, and, and it's they, true. And, and they wouldn't, and, and then they wouldn't have hospital-acquired well pseudomonas. Case managers being doing everything yeah. well, and you know, so if you read literature about stroke centers, they all say stroke centers are really great, and then they, you read about COPD centers, and the COPD ward is really good, and then a heart failure ward, a diabetes ward, and then you read what, why are they really good? And it has never has to do with the diabetologist or the oh, yeah. expert. It's oh, yeah. always about there's better nursing Simple and measures. better social service. Yeah. 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 And social, you know, actually our pay, our hospitals are tremendously inefficient. No business would take somebody, put them somewhere, and they disappear, and nobody sees them 22 hours out of the day. Our, if our hospitals actually were managed in a way where you where you try to maximize what happens to patients in all these ways, and social service is a big part of that. Nursing's another big part of that. Of course they would do better, and we could do the same thing in the emergency room. So that means somebody's got to pay for it. Somebody's got to decide to do it. I like it. this one. That's Rick, a this is a good one. Drive up service. I like this. Maybe we could go all the way to drive through. <laughs> um, but drive up service for patients who aren't ambulatory where they can get into the emergency department without having some, some drama in the parking lot where they're being carried in. And uh, I could see this going right from drive up to drive through where they could ask for a Vicodin combo supersized. Um, <laughs> with fries. You know, uh, the, the other one here that I thought would be interesting to talk about is the doctor suggested uh, CT brains need no authorization from radiologists. Ooh, where's that? I'm loving that. Who has where, to ask who's a radiologist for permission? Where are you? Where, what environment are you practicing in? In where? In New Brunswick. Do you actually have to ask Jim Ducharme to get that CT? Yeah. Who actually has to be? No, asking a radiologist for permission. What I like to do when they, when they start saying they want permission, one of my favorite moves to do is just to push the patient actually into the reading room. And then uh, and they're, they're moaning. I like a moaning sort of violent patient. They, what are you doing? What are you doing? Like, Listen, if you want to make the clinical decisions, you should examine them and see them. And oh, God, no. There's nothing more frightening to a radiologist than the potential of actually have to, having to sully their hands 
uh, with direct patient care. I'm happy to have their advice. I'm happy to tell them what they think they need to know to tell me the best study. But other than that, please shut up. It's a problem. Rec That's recognize a problem. you're a technician. The only reason your specialty exists is that once upon a time to get a chest <laughs> x-ray, you, you had to have a particle accelerator in your hospital and you didn't want people to blow up and shit. That's why now a chimpanzee can shoot a chest x-ray and a chimpanzee can do a head CT. You know, and, and I don't really want their help on it. Just be the technician you are. So Go back to the, sleep. One of the things is make friends with other people in the hospital. <laughs> it's about outreach. <laughs> No, but it was like that and when I was in New Zealand. It was like, is it like that in Australia? It's like that in, in, in England very, very much. Yeah. And, and we're, we're sort of lucky in the States in that emergency medicine is, is really more, much more um, yeah, we don't, a specialty in very few places where you have to do these types of things. In England, when I first got there, we, uh, one of the first patients I saw was uh, somebody who, you know, major trauma, altered, blah, 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 and got sent over for... Uh, Head and neck, and they, they sent it back. We want plain film first. But if I was like so a, I went over and I, you know, is this like a, CC, a CCFPEM or an FRCP trained uh, emergency physician and practicing in New Brunswick? I'd have to call for permission to get CTs. Well, I mean, would be Canada. Most, I'm from New Brunswick as well. Is that what's going on here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. poor babies. They have it projected on the ceiling so over they their act bed. like everybody else who, who yeah. basically, they know it's eventually yeah. going to get done, but just I can push it back and exactly. push it back. So the yeah. issue of needing permission comes down to them wanting to use the technology if they're wanting to more be comfortable to use for them to interpret the CTs right. better. Like so, so the group at Little Company of Money, I mean Mary, um, they are a 22-member radiology group who, on their business expense, bought a villa in Spain. And so two members of their group are there so that they can read, you know, after an espresso and, and, a, and a croissant in the morning, they can read our scans in daylight while we're slaving in the air at night. But asking a radiologist, I, I mean, you're asking the least clinical person, right? We talk about the me specialties, radiolami, ophthalmolami. So, it's all about me. We're 10 minutes over. Um, you're, 10 to minutes ask over. A, so a non-clinical me that. specialty to give you permission for a clinical decision it's about, it's like going to the lowest common denominator. They have absolutely no clinical skills or anything about this, and that's why pushing the patient in there is good for them, because it's like, oh, Jesus. You can't solve this on a, you can't have solve we, this on a patient-to-patient patient basis. Here. You have to fix it. That's not. Yeah, that has to be fixed. That has to be fixed. That's a problem. Uh, yeah. 